Hello and welcome. My name is Sarah Sims and I am the manager of continuing education for the Brown School here at Washington University in St. Louis. I have just a few housekeeping items before we get started with today's program. First of all, thank you for joining us for today's Open Classroom. Open Classroom is the Brown School's virtual and free professional development series. We have produced over 200, it's hard to believe, over 200 of these webinars that are all recorded and available on our website and our YouTube channel, which I'll put a link to in the chat. Um, we are also the largest provider of continuing education units in the state of Missouri. So if you are looking for CEUs or just some deeper learning, I invite you to check out our website, which is brownschool.wustl.edu, and then you can navigate to the resources and initiatives tab. We offer workshops year round and almost on a weekly basis. Um, so this webinar, it, it is a webinar, which means we can't see or hear you, but we do really want to engage with all of you in the chat. Some of you are already saying hello and where you're zooming in from. Um, we invite you to say hello. Uh, we also invite your comments and questions for our panelists today. You can put those in the chat at any time, and then we'll be moderating a Q&A at the end. Um, uh, we will also be where we are uh, streaming this live on YouTube, which I'll drop a link to in the chat as well if you want to share with any friends who weren't able to join us on Zoom. So now I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Ali Gillespie, who is a research manager with Salama, the study of adolescent lives after migration to America. Um, Ali is going to introduce our program and our great panelists of speakers for today. Ali, please take it away. Thanks, Sarah. Um, my name is Ali. As Sarah mentioned, I'm the research manager with Salama. Um, and this is the second session of the Salama, no Salama webinar series. So welcome. Uh, Salama is the study of adolescent lives after migration to America. Uh, we're a mixed method study conducted by Washington University in St. Louis with support from Qatar Foundation International or QFI. And our study, our study seeks to better understand the experiences and psychosocial well-being of in-school adolescents with a focus on immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers from the Middle East and North Africa region who are living in the United States. Uh, the purpose of this webinar series is to disseminate our study findings and to engage with educators, practitioners, researchers, and policymakers across contexts who are committed to supporting um, student populations. So for those of you joining us for the first time, we encourage you to continue watching our webinar series, even go back and watch the first one if you missed it. Um, that one was focused on strategies to support multilingual learning in U.S. schools. Um, Salama is supported by QFI, which is an international organization that advances Arabic language education across the world, um, and it is currently operating in the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, and Italy. QFI supports Arabic language programs and works to increase access to Arabic instruction for educators and students around the world. Um, so today's session of the webinar series is focused on programs and interventions, and we're so excited to be hosting alongside Refugee Education UK, or REUK. Um, before I turn it over to our amazing co-hosts, I just want to give a brief overview of the two Salama programs that you'll hear about today. So after a few years of mixed methods research to better understand the needs of newcomer youth in several cities across the U.S., the LAMA developed and implemented programs with our partners in the Detroit metropolitan area in Michigan. Um, so one of these programs is called Empower, um, and this was a seven session photo voice program that incorporates participatory action research elements in order to center newcomer student experiences and priorities. And we also developed and implemented Forward with Peers, which is a 10 session school based program to bolster leadership and social emotional and learning skills. Um, we recently completed a waitlist control trial of Forward with Peers, um, which we haven't um, shared any of our findings, but it has shown both promising and significant improvements in students' resilience, social support, and reduced suicide ideation. Um, so our Salama panelists will share a bit more about these programs today in conversation with our co-hosts. Um, so now I would like to introduce our moderator and co-host from Refugee Education UK, Amy Ashley. Amy is a research manager at Refugee Education UK, where she manages their research on refugee education issues in the UK and globally. Amy specializes in child and youth-centered research methods and has more than six years experience in research and policy 
for child-centered organizations, both national and international. She holds a master's in international child studies from King's College London, and her academic research is focused on the intersection of forced displacement, psychosocial well-being, and education. It is so great to have you with us, Amy, and I'll turn it over to you now to tell us a bit more about REUK and introduce our panel. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, well, it's so lovely to be here today and I have the pleasure of moderating this really um, exciting discussion. Um, to first just introduce our UK and the work that we do. Um, so we're a charity based in the UK that enables um, young refugees to thrive in education. We support young refugees living in England and from around the world in lots of ways um, and through a number of programmes. Um, so, for example, by training and matching them with volunteer mentors, by giving advice and guidance for accessing and progressing in education, delivering one to one intensive well-being support for young refugees with acute mental health and well-being needs um, and running leadership and advocacy courses which embolden and empower refugee leaders. Um, you will hear about some of these programs from Maria and Yosef um, shortly when, when they come to um, talk about um, their programs. Um, so to introduce our wonderful panel today, um, I'll start with Ali. Ali. Um, so Ali is a research consultant with 10 years experience working in the fields of education, research and health advocacy. Ali has worked in multiple roles, ranging from a researcher in emergency medicine at St. Mary Mercy Hospital, um, a health educator at the Access Child and Adolescent Health Centre, and a mental health therapist at the ACC Community Mental Health Clinic. While the existing gap in healthcare services impacted underserved families and the Metro Detroit community, Ali founded the UM Dearborn Lions to aid in filling in those gaps by providing free healthcare services and relief efforts. Whilst Ali was a health educator at Access, he created and implemented social emotional learning programming for schools and organizations throughout the Metro Detroit community, which thousands of school students, staff and community members participated in. Ali works with Dr. Lindsay Stark and Dr. Alana Seff on the study of adolescent lives after migration to America, where he has co-created, implemented and facilitated the Forward with Peers program and the Empower Photo Voice program. To come to Maria then, so Maria Donetz is an Education Welcome Project Officer at Refugee Education UK. She's the first point of contact for refugees and asylum seekers looking for educational advice and guidance on education. Her previous experience is running an NGO, Goncharenko Center in Ukraine, which provides free education to around 10,000 people of different ages every month. She is the co-founder of the Ukrainian Volunteer Service, an NGO with 7,000 members, which focuses on developing a culture of volunteering. Since 2016, she has consulted various charities on how to improve their organizational culture and work more efficiently with volunteers. She was previously a youth delegate representing Ukraine at the United Nations General Assembly in 2018. Andrea Belgrade's academic work highlights the multidimensionality of experiences among structurally marginalized groups, highlighting the coexistence of individual and community strengths and vulnerabilities. Andrea has also got extensive advocacy and policy experience, having worked with the National Conference of State Legislatures and served as co-president of Graduate Rackham International. Andrea currently works at the University of California, Office of the President, where she conducts system-wide survey research to inform university policy. She also consults through her LLC, Method for Change, which donates 2% of its revenue to support refugee education. And finally, Yusuf Sane is a senior educational well-being support worker for REUK. He develops and delivers well-being and mental health training to a range of internal and external groups and organisations in order to better support their work with newcomer adolescents. Further to this, he supports staff members working directly with newcomer adolescents to help address their psychosocial support needs. Yusuf has previously worked um, has worked previously with a one-to-one -one caseload of young people, providing well-being and psychosocial support, advocacy and signposting. And I think after that, you can all agree we've got an absolutely wonderful panel for our discussion today. So welcome everyone and welcome to our panel. Um, I'm going to start now by asking a range of questions and I'll call on each one of you to, um, to respond. 
And my first question, um, which really brings in both RE UK and Salama programming. And I wondered if we could start perhaps with Yusuf. Could you describe RE UK's current or recent programming, um, including the methodologies you use to design programs to ensure that they are youth centered, empowering, and strengths based? Yeah, sure. Um... So when it comes to uh, program design, RUK has always adopted a needs-based approach. Um, programs have been developed where we've recognized there being a real gap in the sector of support. And that's how we started as an organization uh, with our founder recognizing that newcomer adolescents were not able to progress within education without additional support, um, which was not being provided by schools or colleges at the time. So this led to the development of our mentoring program, our first program, which uh, now operates on a national scale. Um, we then found that mentees on the mentoring program were faced with additional challenges such as housing, immigration, legal, mental and physical health, uh, which led to the development of our well-being program to try and address those needs. And then during that time, uh, we also found specific challenges to newcomer adolescents when entering colleges. These were issues kind of such as enrollment or access to courses, funding, progression, which led to the creation of our educational progression team. So um, RUK now has, I think, five major programs, and I won't go into them all, but just wanted to highlight how we've always placed the need of young people first and then developed programs to fulfill that need as best we can. So our programs are really um, as necessary and as useful as possible to newcomer adolescents. Um, in terms of program design, I'll, I'll speak about the, the well-being team that I'm a part of. Um, so as I said, we saw a need and we created our program. Uh, this led to us covering a wide variety of support needs, but also led to us becoming quite reactive in the work that we were doing. Uh, we'd identify a problem that a young person was faced with and then immediately try and solve the problem for them. Um, and there's nothing wrong with this uh, per se, but it didn't feel like the best approach regarding longevity of both support workers and uh, young people. So a couple of years ago, we conducted an independent evaluation of our program uh, involving both young people active on our caseload and historic um, and ourselves as practitioners and the evaluation provided us with really great insight into what we were doing really well and also what we could change and improve and implement. So from that, we've really tried to design a youth-centered and empowering program that's been sort of at the heart of it. Um, so we aim to come from a trauma-informed perspective, uh, not a trauma-prescriptive perspective. And this means understanding the challenges a young person's faced and does face will be responded to them and by them in a unique way that we can't understand all the time. So trauma is not a, like a cookie cutter uh, phenomenon and individuals respond to it differently. So it's important for us as practitioners to understand most of us, most of us having lived lives of relative safety and security, that the experiences that we may find challenging and potentially traumatic may not be challenging for young people who've experienced far greater trauma or challenges. Um, we also attempt to raise the self-efficacy of young people. So whilst, whilst our knee-jerk reaction is to, to jump in and to help them as quickly as possible, um, we found that this can lead to sort of an unhealthy power dynamic within support work and where you become the sole kind of person that they look for for their, for their need to help. So support work can't be a long-term solution for young people who have their whole lives ahead of them. And the sort of socioeconomic structures that young people find themselves in and uh, are very challenging and continue to get more difficult to navigate. And we really want to try and prepare them for that. So what this looks like in practice is instead of doing something on the young person's behalf, we try to support them to do it um, as this teaches them how to navigate the society they find themselves in. So this has really led to us have to reassess lots of aspects. And, and one of them is capacity um, of our support workers and, and what that looks like. So I could perhaps fill out a form for a young person, um, but to support a young person to fill out a form, and I could fill out a form and that would take me around five minutes, let's say, but to support a young person to fill out a form, it could take several hours. So we've really had to reduce the number of uh, newcomer adolescents we work with at any given time, but we found the work that we do with them is more effective. They return back to the program less and they can take more control of their lives. So the way we try and think about it is preparing the person rather than the path. So 
we can try and take all of the obstacles that are in a person's way um, to help them navigate it. But once we stop working with them, those obstacles will be there and they won't have been able to navigate it themselves. So we try and teach them how to navigate those obstacles, which will then empower them to be able to navigate the path themselves. So we've really had to redefine what success is, what capacity is, what our work looks like. And I think that's really allowed us to develop more impactful programming that serves and prepares our young people best. Thank you so much for sharing that. And it's um, really clear that in, in kind of your work and the approach that you take, it's taking a step back and really listening to what the young person needs, even if that's not necessarily what um, we might initially assume it might need. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I'd like to call on Andrea. Would you be able to share your response to the same sort of question about um, empowering and new centered programming? Yeah, definitely. And before I actually directly answer you, I want to do a quick experiment with everyone in the audience. So I want you to just take a moment and just think what's the first image that flashes into your mind when you hear the word research. So for me, I actually have an almost cartoonish image of like someone in a white lab coat, like pipette. Um, everyone has a different image, but I think something in common, I think with most people's image is that it's somebody who is doing unto its subject. Uh, the subject that they're studying, whether it's a person or something else, it's very passive. Uh, it's not an active member in the research. You know, if, even if you think human subjects research, like survey, you know, you're you're giving out these questions. They're filling them out. Uh, you might also think of kind of this controlled lab environment where the scientist or the researcher is, you know, trying to limit or completely reduce the bias, um, like completely eliminate it. Um, and really, they're not interacting so much with communities or with people. Photo voice, which is what we've done uh, in the Salama program, it completely turns all these assumptions on its head. So in photo voice, participants are co-investigators. They're on an equal plane with the researchers. They're both seen as experts, although experts in different things. Uh, participants actually drive the process. In a really good photo voice study, participants may drive it to some extent, even more than the facilitators. Um, and they also are, it's like a type of participatory action research. And so that completely challenges this idea of bias and separation between researcher and the person being researched. Um, we actually partner together uh, and we really hope to make positive change through the research process. Um, so it's completely different, I think, than like the most typical view of what research is and what science is. Um, and so maybe just to also help you, I think most people would not be familiar with the actual process of photo voice. So I'll just quick go through that. Um, so usually when you begin a project, you might identify a topic, uh, could be super broad, like health, health in your community. Uh, it could also be more specific. It could be a set of research questions. Um, and so you share that with participants. You have this opening session. You kind of get them oriented to you know what kind of project you're planning to do get people to kind of know each other get comfortable um, and then they go out into their communities and they start taking photos that address these themes or these questions uh, and then they return and they get into kind of small groups and they share their photos uh, they describe them and it's these photos and their descriptions of the photos that are the impetus for the discussion so I want you to think about a focus group or an interview, you know, both qualitative methods that really allow for participants to be a little more active than maybe the more typical quantitative methods. Um, but in those cases, you know, you're, you're the researcher, you're bringing the questions to them and you're really directing that. In photo voice, it's these photos and it's their descriptions and you're using that to then maybe probe further and try to get deeper. Um, so it's completely led by the participants when done right. Um, and the other thing that we do in Salama, it doesn't happen in every photo voice study that I think is really powerful is participants actually learn to code their own data, like they analyze their own data. Um, I mean, I can't think of a single survey study where I have filled out the survey and they invited me to be a part of the analysis, right? Um, you know, and of course, there's practical reasons for that. Um, but 
you know, we've seen that uh, we can actually teach adolescents uh, the same kind of methods that I've taught undergrads. Um, they learn, you know, thematic coding, for example, by Brown and Clark, if anyone out there is familiar. Um, they you know, learn to, you know, code, they make coding structures, and then we allow them to really choose what they want that final product to look like. And typically, it's much more artistic. So they might have, you know, posters that kind of describe these um, things they've discovered through coding. Um, and then we actually often will have like public galleries and I've taken them there and one time it was hosted at um, a university and the participant was like, oh, look, we're famous and like pointing to their posters and they saw people interested and in looking at these and it's just such an empowering thing for people to see that others are interested in their stories and that they can be an active part of the telling of those stories really throughout the entire process. So. Thank you. It's a really interesting insight and um, it's just really resonated with me how you know we trust young people to be experts um, in their lives. Um, so for, for the audience, if you have any questions um, for yourself or Andrea, um, kind of around youth-centered and empowering um, and strengths-based programming, please do start to put them in the chat and we'll have a chance to kind of respond to a couple of them um, after um, towards the end of the session, after I've gone through a couple more questions with the other panelists. Um, so I'd like to move to my next question. I'd like to um, address this to, to Ali and Maria. Um, thinking around kind of um, the strategies that you might use to recruit and engage newcomers in your programming. Um, Ali, I wondered if you wanted to, to go first. Sure. Uh, when, when it comes to strategies of engaging newcomers and programming, uh, the, the first thing that comes to mind for me is, uh, what type of setting am I, uh, am I envisioning the program being in? Is it during school hours, after school hours, or is it at an organization or community center outside of the school? Um, and it, approaching each one strategically so that you know who to speak to, uh, what to communicate on, what expectations to set moving forward is, is very critical. And so... <clears throat> For example, in any of these cases, if you have uh, a program that's going to be hosted during school hours or after school hours or even somewhere else, your participants are going to be uh, adolescents who are school aged. And so building relationships with uh, local uh, community members, organizations and school uh, admin is very is very critical because uh, then when you have a program or you have uh, something envisioned, you could go speak to them about it and potentially recruit from their students to participate in what you have going on. And so let's say you want to host a program during school hours where uh, you communicate with the school staff, let's say principal, social worker, or teacher uh, about what you have planned. Uh, if it's a 10-week session or if it's a 25-week program or or and so forth, um, they'll they'll help you identify a class that's feasible maybe uh, a time that works for the students a time that works for the facilitator uh, uh, a group that will benefit from it um, and then you move on from there uh, creating flyers to send home to the parents uh, flyers for the teachers to inform them about the programming um, and if you have any data to support the program, any stories of individuals who had participated in the program before to be shared at that point to kind of get that buy-in of uh, implementing programs for newcomers. Um, if you have any incentives uh, or certificates of participation or prizes or even any hands-on activities or field trips that the participants will uh, participate in during the programming to highlight those to you know get that further attraction uh, from individuals. Uh, programming after school uh, is, is, is a bit more challenging than in school because then you're taking them outside of that classroom. Uh, it could still be within the school, though. Maybe you're in a cafeteria or in a designated space or in a classroom or in any, any type of setting that's, uh, that was given to you to facilitate that uh, extracurricular program. And so 
uh, giving, uh, uh, then, then it becomes a bit more of a challenge to kind of lure the students to come and to attend the program and be consistent for the 10 weeks or the 25 weeks beyond the first session. Uh, if you were to host a program outside of school, uh, keeping things in mind, like accessibility, how far is it from the school? What time is the session being hosted? Um, are there any little incentives because it's after hours, maybe a little snack here and there to uh, give students, but uh it, when it, when it comes to recruiting uh i feel like those things are very important to keep in mind um now engaging newcomers in programming i feel like allowing participants to fully express themselves in a safe and comfortable environment has always been the key in uh allowing them to engage as much as possible where they feel comfortable in sharing their past experiences or their expectations moving forward, or how they're feeling and what's going on and, and to become leaders in the future in a lot of these places. And something that I do typically is I allow the participants to set their own expectations during the first session and ground rules of what they want moving forward for the entire program. And so expectations could be for themselves, um, of their colleagues, of the facilitator, and of the program, so that they have an idea, they have a say in kind of uh, what's happening. Um, ground rules could be anything that really revolve around behavior or, you know, uh, respecting each other, because it's extracurricular. And sometimes students, especially when you have a facilitator who, who doesn't have that grade book, and this is just voluntary for them to be part of, uh, you, you have to have those ground rules to have that structure moving forward. Um, group activities and games, uh, so that it's not always just a presentation and a little assignment. Um, small group discussions and large group discussions where you give participants the space to express themselves to each other more one-on-one -on -one, um, and then uh, be, being able to listen to what other people have to say in the classroom or in the session so that they kind of build that sense of community where it, maybe it's not just me that's going through this or has experienced this and that's what that person did and maybe I could do that too. Um, giving participants the space to lead discussions where uh, maybe it's a topic of interest or um or it's an activity or a game that's going on giving them the floor to uh take that leadership in in, in that environment that they've built uh together um that's that's what's come to mind right now thank you so much ali and i think what's quite clear from what you've said is um not only is it important in the way that you have described about what you're doing being really responsive to the needs and um uh yeah the, the needs of young people but also how you're doing that being really responsive as well so thank you for sharing that um maria same question to you good evening everyone um well i'm working on um a welcome project which means that we are designed sort of to give um, advice to newly arrived refugees and asylum seekers. Um, but also it also means that we don't really run sort of long-term support programs. Other programs in ROK do that. But for us, uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, attracting young people and how they find information about us um, and how they come for the first advice, we don't really uh, recruit as much and um, uh, I don't want to sound like I'm bragging but being Refugee Education UK we actually have um, even more demand and more people coming for advice and sometimes the weekend meet which means that there's just um, unfortunately not enough support systems in place so that um, there is not not even uh, such a dire need to sort of recruit um, young people. We do. Uh, we are currently trying to make our social media uh, more sort of youth focused and uh, more targeted at young people. Um, but even um, you know, it, even without that, um, we've been uh, working starting from um, a small charity that was just run in one specific area in London uh, with the help of a local church. Uh, but like 10 years down the road, we also have a lot of uh, people who do cross-referencing. So uh, people just sort of know about us um, in, in a kind of um, narrow and not so much narrow circles of refugees and asylum seekers. They pass information. So there's no lack of um, sort of incoming people who seek support. Um, of course, we also do try to, um, you know, make... Um, 
uh, our information and our advice and support as much um, accessible as possible. So we've got um, lots of um, uh, speakers of different languages on the team. So we're trying to maximize um, being approachable sort of uh, and, and making sure we deliver information um, that is easy to understand and, and easy to comprehend um, uh, so that young people feel uh, more comfortable actually approaching us. They know that if they do, um, the need will be met. Um, so that that is also a very, very important um, thing that I feel that we are doing and that we are providing. Um, in terms of uh, engagement, uh, of course, we are also trying to always see uh, if um, youth voices are heard, if they're amplified um, in, within an organization and in every program. Uh, we are engaging youth in advocacy, so uh, we have a specific um, sort of designated member of staff uh, whose role is um, to um, sort of make sure that youth voices are heard uh, and uh, how are they uh, actually that we are taking in consideration the lived experience every time we, we're discussing sort of policy um, um, uh, within the organization or a countrywide one. Um, so another thing we do um, is we have youth advisory boards um, and my colleague will speak about it later. Uh, but these are um, bodies that consist of young people that we engaged in and from whom we're getting uh, feedback on the organization or um, in, in, in its wide or on some specific um, ex extra sort of programs that we run. For example, we have an anti-racism group uh, and that one, um, this group also have um, an accountability um, group, accountability board. Sorry if I'm not uh, naming correctly, but again, my, co my colleague Yusuf will speak more about it uh, a bit later. Uh, and this um, um, uh, sort of body also has young, young, young people in those um, in this. Uh, so, so that's on the um, uh, engagement uh, part of it, uh, but again, both recruitment and, and engagement um, sort of a part of um, a, a wider way of how we're designing our programs. Um, so, so it all m matches with um, uh, what users have been talking about uh, answering the first question, essentially. Thank you, Maria. And I think um, both you and Ali have shared two very different programs, but very clearly highlighted the importance of being really accessible and meeting young people where they are and responding to that. So, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm actually going to call on you, Maria, for my my third question. Um, and you've talked a bit about how um, your program isn't necessarily a longer term program in terms of providing immediate kind of guidance. Um, but thinking about kind of the sustainability of your program, um, so what challenges might you face in like implementing sustainable programs with supporting these newcomer adolescents? Um, sure, uh, I will try to do less of a um, so people are not tired of my voice. Uh, English is not my first language, so I apologize um, in advance. And it's uh, already 7 p.m. here in the UK. Um, so coming to challenges well of course of course we are working uh, in an environment that is highly regulated but often poorly regulated so of course a lot of programs that we do and their um, impact and long-term sustainability depends on policies in the environment around uh, people seeking refuge in the UK uh, or uh, people getting refugee status um, so for example how can you make sure that you support someone sustainably in long term if there is always a risk that that person might be sent um, into the home country or sent out of the country at some point um, there are lots of other risks um, involving um, you know, at some point you might wonder um, if your work will actually become illegal because, um, yes, we are not um, allowed to give um, migration advice. We don't work directly with this. We try to link up young people with, um, you know, other support systems that do work this um, um, uh, legal sort of field of question. But uh, we have a lot of requests that are outside of the country, a lot of requests that are then leading for us cross-referencing young people and there's always this gigantic question of how much uh, information and support we can actually provide to one person um, depending again on, on what the current policy is um, and of course uncertain futures uh, for refugees and asylum seekers um, again impact sustainability uh, hugely uh, so uh, for example I am Ukrainian and so um, it's a, a sort of um, it was my destiny. I do work with a lot of Ukrainians um, and uh, I 
of, of course, I should say that the programs that both the UK and the US are having for Ukrainians is unprecedented and the amount of support we get uh, is uncomparable, unfortunately, with the little amount of support other refugees and asylum seekers may be getting. But even with us, uh, our futures are uncertain. There are no, we don't get indefinite leave to remain. Um, there is a sort of an end date and a lot of Ukrainians do want to go home and the programs are built a lot around sort of involvement of local people, so an involvement of um, UK hosts, for example, uh, with the specifically um, UK uh, program for Ukrainians. Uh, and people will face challenges with housing, for example. And with Ukraine, we do have privilege uh, to sort of go back home, even though it's dangerous for us. Uh, so a lot of people might even leave. And you already put a program of support in place, for example, for a child in school you've consulted a school how to do that but this program might not even um, be able to be in the running in a long um, um, sort of in a long impactful way um, and another issue that i think a lot of charities and ngos are facing not just the ones that work with um, refugees and young people is of course uh, sustainability in funding uh, and what we can um, sort of do um, with the funding that was provided to us because a lot of funding has its own restrictions for example uh, age limits or, um, or so so you end up working a lot and providing a lot of support for those um, that are uh, below 18 or sort of 18 to 25. And then there's a massive drop of support uh, in funding for those the, uh, people who work with adults um, who might still need just as much support. Uh, so that lack of um, a sort of sustainability that depends on uh, financial support is uh, another massive, of course, challenge um, for those who work with newcomers. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. You shared some really, um, yeah, challenging external um, barriers that might um, face programs looking kind of to, to sustain themselves in the longer term. So thank you for sharing that. Ali, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add in terms of the challenges your program faces in, in um, yeah, sustainable and long term programming. Yes, I can add some points to what uh, Maria had shared. Um, when it comes to <clears throat> my experiences in developing programs and implementing for uh, newcomers in the Metro Detroit area, uh, programming that revolves around well-being, social emotional learning, and more specifically, I want to discuss the area of, of mental health uh, and the challenges that I've I faced uh, when it comes to that. Um, primarily revolve around stigma that a lot of the youth bring and the families bring uh, when it comes to seeking care or uh, their experiences when it comes to uh, mental health or their tra traumatic background experiences where they come from. And as a community, being able to be open and share with others and receive support, um, you you tend to come in some areas and obstacles that lead to reluctance in seeking help or treatment and uh, less likely to stay in that treatment or intervention long term because of the community mindset and the stigma that revolves around mental health and social emotional learning programming. Um, in some cases, it might lead to, to even social isolation that we've noticed in, in newcomers and in youth, or it could be bullying or physical or, uh, or uh, verbal violence and harassment amongst each other. Um, Another big one is uh, where there's a lack of understanding uh, by by the family or their coworkers or uh, their teachers and staff of um, what's what's what they're experiencing and what what they're going through and what they need. And so, <clears throat> to to strategically kind of overcome these obstacles uh, over the years, I've had the opportunity to develop educational programming for parents um, and staff to kind of tackle that 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 area so that if they open up the door for me to have programming and host programming with youth in the schools or in the community organizations it made it much easier because then i was able to uh, open up their minds uh, mindset around mental health and uh, self-care and well-being and that type of thing um uh, you know many many people know what what to do when you have a cut or if somebody were to roll their ankle, it's as simple as, uh, you know, going to see the doctor. But that's something that a lot of these people could see and kind of address right away. But there's a lot of issues that youth and newcomers struggle with that are unseen. And so then the issue comes of how, how do they tackle that? How do they deal with it? And so developing educational programs 
uh, not just for the youth, but also for the parents and community members to kind of have uh, that mind shift for the future. Um, in addition to the outreach and social who don't see eye to eye on certain topics or um, uh, social emotional extracurricular programming beyond the school environment. And so that really hits the next big area of challenges that we, we experience is the longevity, the longevity of having uh, school staff or other professionals continue implementing programming beyond the time that, let's say, a facilitator from Salama or another organization was implementing it. And so having the capacity to be flexible with the organizations or schools and and training their staff or uh, developing future mentors from these students who want to come and co-lead again, uh, where they have that leadership experience now and host uh, co-hosting the sessions maybe after graduating from high school, or they could become mentees during uh, the sessions where they uh, do one-on-one -on -one with the other peers that are enrolled in the program. And so I feel like uh, as a community, uh, we, we've moved pretty uh, heavily uh, in overcoming some stigma around mental health in comparison to 10 years ago or even five years ago. And, and my hopes is to continue uh, battling that so that it becomes very normalized uh, in, in our area and you know, across the world. Thank you so much, Ali. That's really interesting insights. And again, I think, um, you know, a very different kind of challenges um, than Maria's highlighted, but both highlighting real external barriers and, and interesting that you've highlighted those around kind of uh, community assumptions and and um, stereotypes around mental health support and the type of programming that you're trying to deliver. Um, that's wonderful. Thank you. So I will move on to our final question, which I think is kind of drawing together the different threads and really thinking about how we can measure um, our program outcomes and our impact. Um, so I'll call first on Andrea. Um, yeah, how have you been able to kind of measure program outcomes and impact with, with your work and your programming? Yeah, so I, I thought I would share um, kind of some more best practices or like kind of things to consider about like, that might apply more broadly uh, to people listening. Um, so I think usually the most typical way of evaluating is survey. Um, you know, it's fairly quick, um, involves low resources. You can compare across time very easily. Um, it's pretty fast. And I think it has a really high potential to be actionable. Um, you know, I think people kind of understand survey data. Um, it, you can usually kind of get some results from that. Um, but I think inherent in surveys, there are some challenges uh, that I think are kind of good to be aware of. So that's what I'm planning to kind of like kind of go through, like things that you might think about. Um, so I think one of the biggest things is that researchers are the ones choosing these items. Um, and so they are the ones defining success. Uh, so when you're trying to evaluate a program, you're trying to figure out, you know, is this successful? But what does success mean? And does that mean different things to different people? It's heavily value laden, you know, the way that you think someone should develop. People may not all agree. Um, so, for example, it, 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 you might even think it, it agrees. You might use the same word. You might say like, oh, we want to be happier, you know, something very basic. Um, but what do we actually mean when we say happy? Right. Are we actually picturing the same thing? Um, happiness for me may not be the same thing as it is for Ali, right? Uh, and we've seen that in research, right? Uh, so we, there's research on ideal affect. So we see in the US, there's much more emphasis on like being like kind of excited, happy. Whereas in East Asia, there's a lot more emphasis on like calm, tranquil, kind of like being more at peace. So it's kind of a low arousal versus high arousal, kind of positive, positively valenced emotion. So people may understand these words differently. So when you're doing a survey, are people even thinking the same thing that you're thinking when they're filling it out? Um, so one way that you can address that is through like cognitive interviewing practices. So really going through your survey questions with kind of your intended audience and figuring out, you know, have them just think aloud, like what are they thinking about when they're reading these things? Like, what does it mean to them? What images are coming up in their mind? Um, and then also just recognizing that the concepts that they may choose to kind of develop towards, you know, it's it may be different than what you would choose. So you may want to have something in advance of a survey where you really kind of check these assumptions and really are like working with uh, your community that you're planning to evaluate. 
Um, I would also encourage people, especially since this is kind of aimed more towards um, practitioners, to really be open uh, to the sort of things that you're just seeing uh, when you're working with people, the kinds of things people have been telling you, and not limiting yourself to these really narrow um, or maybe the most typical kinds of constructs that you would include in an evaluation. Maybe while working with people, you've just noticed these observations, or you've made some certain observations uh, that you think might have kind of some um, ties to like uh, really important outcomes. So for example, when I've worked with adolescent refugees in Salama and outside of Salama, I noticed that in terms of academic striving, it was super important for participants to be able to even imagine a certain future for themselves. That ability to just kind of hope for that or to even be able to picture something for themselves. So for example, uh, especially I think the girls that I've worked with, they'll talk about, you know, prior, they, you know, thought they would never have a career, you know, they just didn't really have any opportunity. And so they they didn't pay attention in school. They would try to bunk class, you know, they wouldn't pay attention. They didn't care. Because why should they? Like nothing, they think that nothing's going to really come out of it. But then when their situations change, maybe they're hearing messages from parents saying, you can do this, you can become a doctor if you want, you can become a lawyer. They really start to internalize that and believe it. And then because they're able to dream for a certain future, they then just became so academically motivated. I've never seen a group of kids striving more strongly, like just so happy that they won a math competition, they won like a spelling bee and like just so proud of it. And it became such a central part of their emphasis um, and like things that they were focusing on. And so if I were evaluating a program, I would look at that because in my interactions with them, that just seemed so, so important, um, but I wouldn't necessarily include it for another group. So I would say to really pay attention to your observations, pay attention to what people are telling you, and then formalize that into your survey and make it actionable so that you can really uh, you know, change things, you can implement programs, you can uh, offer a new service. Um, so that's my advice for anyone planning to do some evaluation. Thank you, Andrea. It's um, that's a really interesting insight and in just how important it is to be really flexible and noticing things that maybe you didn't have written down at the start of your evaluation survey. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, yes, sir, if I come to you now in, in terms of the same sort of question with, with your programme. Yeah, sure. Um, I think there's a lot of overlaps from what I'm going to share with what Andrea shared. I think that she shared so much, uh, yeah, important kind of wisdom in, in the area of impact, which I, I don't know about other organizations, but for us, it's just something we're continuously thinking about and trying to kind of optimize. And um, yeah, it's it's always a, a difficult area to, to measure that requires constant um, adjustment. Um, one of the central tensions in impact measurement is the requirements of funders who often want quantitative data that's easy to depict and display. But in our work, meaningful impact can often come from more qualitative research or, or interactions over periods of time. So um, there's also a challenge between short term frequent monitoring and measurement and then long term monitoring and measurement. So both kind of have their, their benefits and their uh, sort of problems. Um, short term, often the tools are potentially inadequate and too simplistic at capturing meaningful data, but provide us with a more continuous picture of change and development. Um, I think something to be that we've had to become more and more sensitive to is there's an emotional component to uh, measuring impact. And, and we need to be aware of uh, maybe some of the questions that we send out in surveys or ask young people quite frequently say uh, about how they feel or, or an emotional kind of question, it can be triggering and challenging for them to be introspective from potentially quite blunt questions that sometimes we don't always think about sort of like, for example, you know, from one to five, do you feel like there's anyone in your life to support you? And, and that can really trigger feelings of isolation, of, you know, mental health, of all of these things. So I think as practitioners, we really, really need to be mindful of the emotional cost of data collection when it comes to measuring impact. Um, and then having more substantial and long term impact measurement can allow for something more tangible, perhaps. Uh, 
However, I think the largest problem we've encountered with this is the insecurity of the point of collection, because if you've got a great sort of resource for, for measuring impact, but then on the day that you come to collect your feedback from the young people that you work with, and they're having a really bad day, which isn't representative of how your work has gone, it doesn't reflect the long-term nature of the work, and it doesn't reflect what's actually happened and the changes that have been made. So that's that's a difficulty. I think it's it's difficult to define impact and difficult to measure it. Um, going back to what I was saying about increasing self-efficacy, which we've really kind of made central to our program, is that they may, for example, withdraw from education and a young person may withdraw from education and go and get a job. Um, and while that's empowering and they've made that decision and they've decided what they want and all of these things that we're trying to promote, what we're measuring as success potentially for funders or for our programs is for their ability to progress through education. So there's sometimes a tension between like the actual impact on a young person's life and the programmatic impact that we are kind of being funded for in some ways. So I think progression and success, it's always important to remember that progression and success for our young people is circular a lot of the time. It goes up and down, it's organic, it's human. So, and we're doing human work. So when it comes to support work, trying to quantify that can be really challenging um that being said i think the way to successfully uh, gain meaningful meaningful impact is to diversify the means of collection including both long and short term measuring tools um i think the initial the, the the big thing is is access to measuring is is a big barrier that we see um we're working with and are currently in the process of reviewing quite a lot of our measuring tools. Um, and some of the things that we have done to help us in the past is we've translated our measuring tools into the most commonly languages spoken amongst our um, adolescents we encounter. We try to make them youth focused, removing any sort of jargonistic, complex medical language. Um, we've digitized them so they can be used on apps that the young people are already engaged in, such as like WhatsApp rather than trying to get a young person to download and use and learn other platforms or apps we just let's let's meet them where they're at let's go to the things that they're already using and we've also adopted in terms of for quick and frequent measuring an emoji system where young people are already very familiar with that it's a universal um system so uh sort of like a happy to sad face kind of thing um that we can quickly get quick checks that are digital that they can then be stored over short short and frequent checks and then we can have long-term impact to, to measure sort of wider things so really in order to gain meaningful data we need to understand both i think the strength and limitations of all of the tools that we use because at least from from my perspective of of looking at the different tools none of them are perfect and i think to use a variety of them in order to gain the most accurate data in almost like a venn diagrammatic way is is the way i think that we that can lead us to um, actually being able to capture the journeys that our young people are on rather than just capturing, I don't know, something that doesn't quite represent it. Thank you. I um, I think you both shared some really, really uh, interesting insights into how you've tried to make measuring and evaluation a lot more kind of accessible and, um, yeah, flexible um, and responding to some, yeah, real challenges with, with um monitoring and evaluating uh, program success, particularly when it comes to well-being. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, that covers, I feel like we've covered the kind of pretty much a lot of the program cycle from recruitment through to kind of the actual activities that we're implementing through to kind of monitoring and evaluating. Um, we've got, I think um, we've got about 10-ish sort of minutes, possibly just under for questions. Um, so at this point, I will turn to, um, yeah, there's a, a couple, one question in the chat. Um, and I've got one as well that's kind of been coming to me as we've as we've been discussing. Um, so Carol has asked, um, yeah, does anyone do any education of funders about some of the challenges of doing responsive, effective evaluation? So I imagine kind of, yeah, responding probably yourself and um, to your point around funders wanting quantitative data. Um, but yeah, do you, do you know of anything around that? Anyone else in the panel kind of aware of anything in that area? 
Uh, yeah, I think it's a really good question. Uh, thankfully, I don't have too much uh, direct uh, relationship with creating funding applications and actually having to get funding into the organization because I know that's a continuously difficult thing. I think, yeah, there are those tensions that I highlighted. And I think as far as I'm aware, there's not... Uh, it, the problem that I can identify is that there are like levels of organizations which supply funding. So one of the large funders that we've previously worked with is the London Mayor's Office, and they have a large pool of funding that comes through, uh, I think, governmental subsidies, then goes to them. They then have a branch called uh, the London Partnership, the London Youth Partnership. Um, or Partnership for Young London, which then is some of their money goes into that, and then Partnership for Young London then works with lots of organizations in London that are supporting young people. So like, there's this kind of drip down of, of the money. And I think because of that, it's quite difficult to, uh, and, and because there's a depersonalization there with the young people that we're working with on the ground, it's very difficult for that sense of like difficulty of capturing those real like i said human or organic journeys when you're going up those levels i know that hasn't directly answered the question um but yeah it'd be great if if uh there was more around like raising awareness of funders and, and measuring impact i'd uh be curious if anyone else has any ideas to share on it mm. yeah anyone else um on the panel have any insights into that I think it would if we if there's anyone in, in the audience as well who's heard of anything, we'd be really interested, I'm sure, in hearing about that kind of going forward. Um, but yeah, thank you. Um, there's another question in the chat. Um, so are there any tools or assessments that can be used for determining cultural implicit biases that can be used within these programs? So I think, Maria, this is kind of responding to what you were discussing. Um, and yeah, a broader question is quite a quite a challenging one. I'm not sure if anyone on the panel has heard of any kind of tools or assessments. Um, no. Well, again, if I, anyone, go on. I actually think it was Ali Ali who was mentioning this, but just saying that what we do in our UK. Uh, in Refugee Education UK, we run uh, trainings for practitioners um, and, and we think it's um, a sort of very, first of all, there's high demand from practitioners, from teachers, from other charity workers on how to um, work with refugees and asylum seekers um, in sort of an unbiased, um, appropriate way. Um, and so meeting that demand has been um, um, you know, something that we are trying to do. Uh, and then we run, um, and the thing is, we've got lots of lots of uh, positive feedback from practitioners and they're always sort of uh, very involved and very active. And uh, even with previous works that I've done, I've always said that running trainings for teachers and people in education is the best thing you can do because they're the best students. Um, and, and they bring kind of a lot of their own um, stories into it and and so i think targeting bias on systemic level and working with practitioners is one of the ways um, of doing that thank you maria for having for responding ali i, I can add on a little bit to that um it, I, I don't know if there are there most likely is specific tools and assessments that are used to uh, assess or determine cultural implicit biases but um i've to be able to understand and kind of get a sense of any biases that are existent of the community that i'm working with i i tend to conduct surveys or interviews or even meeting with parents or staff where it's not just that one interaction that i'm having with the student or participant in my program but i kind of go a little bit beyond that all right, where, where, where is their, where's the other people that surround them, their mindset on this as well? Because uh, typically they're within the same cultural uh, uh, area. And so whether it's talking to their teachers or to their uh, parents or to their, uh, any, any support network that they have, uh, this could be through uh, 
direct conversations or emails um, or even sending out a pre-program survey uh, just to get a sense of where everyone stands and what they're coming in with and their understanding of uh, social emotional learning programming or mental health and any biases that they have in that regard. And, and then not just before or after, but throughout the program, continuing that conversation to see uh, where they stand, what biases they, 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 they have, and how their perspectives might have had changed um, and to that degree, but being active and proactive throughout the whole process uh, while interacting with them. Thank you so, so much. I'm aware of time and there's been so many really insightful uh, discussions going on. And I think just really, and this one key takeaway from me has just been really meeting young people where they are. Um, and yeah, I really like the quote from Yusuf earlier about preparing the young person for the path and um, not necessarily just the person. Um, so yeah, I will with that hand back over to Ali to close. Great. Thank you so much for joining us for this second session of the Salama webinar series. Uh, we hope you will join us on April 6th at the same time, um, which will be our third session, and it will focus on supporting newcomer student mental health and psychosocial well-being. Um, so go ahead and check out our Salama website. We've added that to the chat. We've also added Refugee Education UK's um, social media to the chat. So make sure to give them a follow as well. Um, and just want to thank our amazing co-host for joining us and the entire panel. Thank you so much. Um, and we hope you stay up to date on our future work. Thanks so much, Ali and um, the panelists today. I did also drop in a link into the chat where you can view all of our past open classroom programs, including all of the ones um, in the Salama webinar series. I put a link as well to where you can um, register for upcoming programs. The April 6th Salama workshop isn't up there yet, but it will be soon. So grab that link from the chat so that you can register for that program. Thanks again to everybody, um, the panelists and for our attendees for joining today. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.